Okay, well, um, why don't we get going uh, again? So uh, really happy that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. David Lewis uh, has agreed to talk to us about disruptive technology development. Uh, David is a program manager currently at the DARPA DSO. Uh, he's the one managing the DARPA Quest program, which is a quest for undiscovered energy and storage technologies. Um, and uh, among many other programs. And uh, he was also taught physics uh, as a professor at the Air Force Academy. And uh, just uh, really, a, um, I don't know, I, he's a program manager, but I also consider him a, a great friend. So, you know, there's a little, uh, I don't know, <laughs> dichon, uh, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> David, thank you. <laughs> yeah, can, can you hear me, uh, Mike Check? Yes. All right. And are my slides showing up? Yes. All right. Excellent. Well, I will go ahead and get started. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Lewis. Thanks for the uh, introduction, Charles. Uh, so, uh, I go by David. And so uh, uh, perfectly fine if you call me that. So um, what I'm talking to today um, is about disruptive technology development. And so uh, when Charles asked me to uh, talk about such a topic, I said, okay, and then in my head, I was like, wow, that is quite a topic to discuss. Um, so what I'm going to attempt to do is maybe take more of a philosophy of science. Take more of a, a philosophy of science type of, of approach to this talk uh, with the hopes that it spurs more conversation. Um, it's not often that I, I get to spend a little bit of time just sort of reflecting uh, on what I've done. Uh, things that I thought, um, you know, always in the throes of management. So uh, here we go. So uh, here's kind of the uh, agenda today. Um, I'll do a little introduction uh, of myself. Um, I know a number of folks who are online, but not everyone. Uh, we'll talk about uh, what's a disruptive technology itself, um, and then kind of dive a little bit deep into what I think really underlies that question. Uh, what's, how do we nature and nurture science and technology? Uh, some of the things that, that Charles had talked about, Charles and Kate talked about earlier, uh, and then kind of finally end up with what are some of the characteristics of a disruptive technology? Uh, what do we see as being truly disruptive and sort of how can uh, we identify it? <clears throat> so uh, as, as Charles mentioned, uh, I've been in the Air Force for, for 17 years now. Uh, 6 one Delta, which is Air Force speak for being a physicist. I've been a tried and true physicist. Uh, I guess I'll say probably since about four or five years old when I was making constructive waves in the bathtub there with my mom. <laughs> in terms of uh, assignments, uh, I've had assignments at Air Force Research Laboratories. I did electronic warfare, electronic attack development, uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, there I was a chief scientist for offensive weapons of counter mass destruction. Uh, I went to school and was a professor at the Air Force Institute of Technology. So I got to teach a lot of the quantum mechanics and electrodynamics courses. I uh, still have nightmares both learning from and teaching from Jackson's book. Uh, if anyone knows. <laughs> uh, I was a uh, operations officer for Joint Special Operations Command, uh, where I got to uh, help design and lead operations um, for some of the things we're doing in the Middle East. And then finally, uh, well, I shouldn't say finally, uh, today I'm a, a program manager of the Defense <laughs> Science. Um, and actually, I'm probably, uh, I would consider myself a, a quote unquote um, uh, elder program manager in the sense that my, uh, my time for my first DARPA assignment uh, is actually coming to an end this year. Um, a little bit more, uh, just sort of personally. So I've uh, been a martial artist my whole life. Um, so when I, was, uh, when I was younger, my mom asked, uh, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think one of the first, uh, first things off uh, from my mouth was I wanted to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Um, so she, <laughs> not a mutant nor a turtle, but maybe I can make you a ninja. Uh, so I've never stopped, uh, you know, <clears throat> studying the martial arts. It uh, goes well with philosophy of life as well. Uh, rock climbing is my latest passion. Uh, you know, we all took up different hobbies during the uh, pandemic. And so uh, outdoor rock climbing and indoor rock climbing, something that, uh, uh, that I've taken up and, and still do today. And uh, this sort of a, a neat fact, um, you know, I was asked this question once, uh, I think sometime last year, if I could study one thing for the rest of my life, what would it be? Uh, definitely the large scale structure of the universe. So that's kind of uh, 
a little bit of introduction to myself, um, sort of experience there. But what we're here today is we're here to talk about uh, disruptive technology, right? So sort of one of the first things that, that one might do when preparing for a talk is to go look up what's the definition of a disruptive technology. Um, so, you know, nowadays we have a Wikipedia instead of, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so, you know, disruptive technology here is an innovation that alters the way that we operate. Um, I think, you know, back in the, the mid 90s, you know, disruptive technology was, was very much a, a term that, that got big in the populace's consciousness. Um, if you talk to folks who are, are more of the business bent, um, they're looking for a disruption technology or innovation to be uh, that thing that creates a new market um, or replaces or displaces an already established uh, market leader. Uh, and then finally, you know, something that I take from my own experience, which I'll say, you know, from quote unquote defense theory, uh, disruptive technology, one is that, you know, puts at risk the, strong, the strategic foundations of any government's instruments of power. Um, so, you know, whether that be diplomatic information, military, economics, uh, any type of technology that can, you know, really shake those foundations uh, is something that you would think of as a disruptive technology uh, from a defense standpoint. Um, now, these are, you know, very, I'd say, large encompassing definitions. Uh, there's a lot to these definitions. Uh, so what I kind of want to start um, this, this small, I guess, shallow dive or deep dive, however you want to look at it, is let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what is exactly the nature of science and technology. So you'll have to, uh, you have to forgive me, I, I'm used to having a, a whiteboard and chalk and all that stuff. I think that's what I did last time. I guess it was in what, 2019? 2020 trials when, when we did this. So uh, I'm used to seeing everyone's faces and trying to you know, go back and forth with, uh, with uh, the bodily reactions. So, uh, so here we go. This is kind of my makeshift whiteboard. I'm gonna display it all at once. So when we think about the nature of science and technology, I think there's at least a general thought um, or at least maybe a, a general um, uh, sort of assumption or conclusion that that science begets technology, right? So you start with science here on the left, uh, and then you move all the way over here to technology on the right. <clears throat> and so maybe sometimes we think of that in a retrospective way. Um, you know, here are just sort of two examples where you think of like Einstein A and B coefficient uh, for laser engineering or semiconductor band gap science uh, to begin with these microchips. Uh, the whole sort of thought is we move from left to right uh, on this scale. Um, and how do we do that, right? Um, I think looking at the audience here, we're all very well uh, and, and appraised of the scientific method here, right? Uh, so there's various ways that you can uh, talk about the scientific method, uh, but in general, you know, it comes down to fact finding. You know, we just want to try and find things. What are the facts of the universe, right? Uh, both on the both on the micro scale and the macro scale. Uh, and then we move over to explanation finding. You know, how can we find explanations for those observed facts? And usually it takes, you know, sort of the look of shallow explanations until we get deeper and deeper into the explanations. And then finally, what we try and do is we try and generalize it somehow, um, either generalize it to make new predictions or, or generalize it so that that theory or whatnot, that explanation can hold up to further scientific scrutiny. Um, you know, this all in well is, is here in the, the science side of the house. Uh, but on the right, um, something that I have uh, learned during my time uh, at DARPA and in personal reading um, is the whole idea of, you know, when you move over to technology, you really sort of invoke this engineering method, uh, which to be honest, I really hadn't heard about until, you know, maybe a couple of years ago. Now, maybe I knew it somewhat intuitively, but I've never seen it in sort of a philosophical context. Uh, so when you sort of look at the engineering method, you hear you have uh, function findings. So what are those human desired functions? So note that we're now, you know, invoking the term of the idea human. Uh, form finding, you know, how do we create those forms to fulfill a function? Uh, and then finally, this uh, term accepting, uh, repurposing forms to fulfill another function, which uh, I believe is a, a word that was co-opted from uh, the biological literature. This is something that uh, evolutionary biologists uh, a word they use all the time. And I, I think some of the more textbook um, examples that I've read are feathers. So, you know, dinosaurs had feathers, uh, you know, during their reign, but the thought is that they used them mostly for 
insulation, uh, but eventually that form uh, was repurposed to fulfill another function of flying for birds today. Um, so when we think of science and technology, uh, when we think about trying to create or develop disruptive technology, you have to ask the question, how do we drive science and technology forward to be disruptive? And so uh, I want to invoke uh, a derivative notation here. Uh, we all know, you know, we have science, we have technology, but really what we're looking for is what is that DSDT and what's that DPDT? How do we drive it forward? And sort of what is that function that exists in the um, if I take a look sort of at the top part of my slide where we kind of think of the traditional approach of science then it leads into technology, um, it really doesn't say much about sort of how this uh, evolves over time, correct? And so when we sort of dive a little bit deeper into the nature of science and technology, um, I think one of the mistakes we do make is thinking that science always comes before technology. Um, and, you know, it's even to the point where this is almost calcified, uh, sort of what uh, Charles and Kate alluded to before, this is sort of calcified in our bureaucracy, um, the way that we fund research, development, technology, so on and so forth, uh, is that we literally put, you know, money in buckets, and we call it, at least in the, the, the Department of Defense parlance, uh, 6162, 63, and 64. So, you know, we fund basics research to a certain level, and then once that basics research becomes mature, then we say we're going to use a different bucket called 6-2 for advanced research. Uh, we move over then, okay, we advance it enough, then we go test and evaluate it, and if it works, we acquire it. So there's sort of this linear inherent scale that's, that's built into the way that we fund uh, research and development. And so, yes, this is a broad generalization. Uh, however, this sort of uh, onsatz, if you will, this way of funding business, uh, science and technology, um, it trickles down to all the other, other organizations that exist uh, within the U.S. government. Um, and so I think, honestly, at this level, this is a limitation, and it's kind of a limitation of not really understanding sort of the nature of science and technology uh, from a, a bureaucratic or organization standpoint. And so uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm skipping a, a lot of steps here to this next bullet from a lot of reading that I, I've read over the past year. Uh, but I really like this sort of thought that, you know, if you want to become a true innovator, you kind of have to become a scientist and an engineer or make sure that both that your team has both. Uh, you know, here, here's a quote that, that really stuck with me uh, some time ago. A scientist builds in order to learn. An engineer learns in order to build. Uh, this is by Fred Brooks, who, who won a, a Turing Award. Um, but so when we think about how is it that science and technology really interact with each other, uh, it's not along the 6162, 63, 64 type of timeline, uh, but really the science and technology or, or moving them forward, the change in science technology uh, really is, you know, in some people's opinion could be cyclic, it goes back and forth, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the examples that, that I love to, to bring up and, and bring in these type of thoughts are the, the two telescopes that I have pictured here, Hubble and uh, J, JWST, which had a, a successful uh, recent deployment. Um, we are using these tools really to understand science, right? Science of the universe. Um, and, you know, you could start at any one point here, but, you know, Hubble gave us, you know, glorious pictures of, of our cosmos. And, and from that learning, from that science, we said, hey, we need to look in other, for example, different electromagnetic spectrums. So we devise experiments and we come up with something like JWST. Um, I would argue, um, and this is, you know, a really simple example to argue, that in order to really understand that science that we want to understand, you have to invoke and incorporate a whole lot of technology, right? I mean, in and of themselves, these, these satellites, I mean, think about all the optics and the electronics and all sort of the technological tools that have been developed. Really what we're using is we're using technology now almost going backwards, right? We're not going 61, 62, 63, 64, but really 62, 63, 62, 61, right? We're going backwards. We're using that technology to actually look and understand more science. So it really goes back and forth. I don't think that science uh, really should be the base or king over technology or vice versa. 
uh, they really need each other. And that's the way that we really should be viewing the nature of science and technology. Um, I almost want to call it techno science, if you will, instead of you know, bringing it up as two different words of science and technology. Um, but I also think that uh, if you want to develop any disruptive technology, you really kind of have to balance this function between the time rate of change of science and time rate of change of technology, both in how you fund it and both of where you put your own human hours into the research that you want to do. You know, a lot of times we like to say, I want to stick with this science, the basic phenomena, but, you know, sometimes you might have to take, you know, a five-year break to go develop the technology so that you can come back and do the science that you actually want to do, right? And so one place that I kind of see uh, an example of um, how difficult it is to manage science and technology really is in the, the area of materials. So, you know, in, in the various positions that I've had in the US government, uh, you know, I come across people with ideas who are really awesome, really exquisite materials um, that, you know, have all these neat properties. But one of the things that it's always difficult to assess or difficult to do is you know how can we learn more about those materials in places that we actually want to use them in, right? So oftentimes you don't have the technology, i.e. the diagnostics to even understand how that material would perform in non-ideal conditions. So therefore it makes it hard to get this potentially disruptive material into actual use. And I see this um, in a number of, um, I'd say maybe obvious disruptive technologies. So, you know, fusion, for example, um, you know, we understand how fusion works. We can have a good idea of how we need to put, for example, electromagnetic fuels together to contain fusion. Uh, but one of the hardest parts is not the actual fire of fusion itself, but really the fireplace to, to go ahead and sort of capture that energy. And it comes to the material difficulties, right? Uh, quantum computing is another example, so, especially when we talk about um, you know, qubit systems, right? You know, take advantage of these two-level systems. Uh, well, if your materials has any type of defect, on your yeah. possible to mute right quick. All right, thank you, Charles. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll continue here. Um, and then another one that is, is really big in the news, you've probably seen uh, our senior leaders in the Department of Defense talk about hypersonic uh, vehicles, um, you know, trying to take the materials, develop materials to, um, to, to actually survive that environment. Well, what diagnostics, what technology do we have to actually learn more about how those materials uh, themselves actually perform? And so, you know, this is just sort of an example of a disrupt, a few examples of a disruptive technology space where uh, we actually don't need more science, we need more technology to see this disruption through. Um, and I always like this, uh, this uh, quote here that I've learned recently from a lot of my material science uh, brethren, uh, God created materials, but the devil created interfaces. And so, uh, you know, that's where we have some difficulty. So this is just kind of a, a two slide thought on sort of, you know, what's the nature of science and technology? You know, we can, we can deep dive more into this, uh, but in the end, uh, if you think of science and technology as separate or one leading to the other, uh, then I contend to you that you're not really understanding or thinking of the nature of science and technology. Um, you know, that's kind of where you need to start if you want to develop uh, some disruptive technology. It says, it says, okay. All right, so we're going to move on um, from the nature of science technology to what I see is, you know. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. Um, hey Jim, could you uh, mute, please? Thank you. Uh, so now I want to move towards, um, you know, something that's more dear, near and dear to my heart uh, and the, you know, positions in government that I've had uh, in my recent career, and that's how do you nurture science and technology? Um, and so, you know, in thinking through a lot of this, I kind of, you know, I'm trying to think about, well, here are some three major forces of, of the, you know, that nurture science and technology, sort of starting from the right here and moving to the left. So we have a driving force, uh, what I call a cultivating force, and sort of our need to share uh, a sharing force. So let's start here on the right. 
uh, when we talk about a driving force. Um, so what's the driving force of science and technology? When it comes down to it, it's human culture, right? And so one of the questions that I like to contemplate on um, really is asking the question, what's the nature of human nature? Uh, it's one of those enduring questions, which I think is, is very important to understand um, because human, or excuse me, science and technology, the development of such really is a, a human endeavor. And so you have to take the good with the bad, right? Um, so here are some ideas that, you know, concepts that uh, we have in our culture, what makes us human, that sort of drives our need for science and technology. Uh, so, you know, there's defense, uh, there's economy, um, you know, there's exploration, which is, you know, my favorite here, you know, I've been a fan of Star Trek since, you know, I first started watching TV. Uh, there's the whole idea, you know, straight up idealism. Um, you know, part of being human also is to learn. And sometimes we just want to make things that have utility. Um, but, you know, those are some of the, I'd say, more uh, positive aspects of human culture. But we also have negative aspects of human culture that, you know, whether we want to uh, agree or disagree or sort of just not shine a light on, uh, there have been many atrocities that have helped, you know, develop science and technology that, that we use today. So I think it's very important to sort of understand, you know, what are those human factors that, that drive how we cultivate, how we nurture science and technology. Uh, then we move on to, okay, this is what we know about ourselves as humans. Um, so how do we cultivate sort of that energy, that power uh, of being human? And it really comes down to how we organize. Now, I'm not gonna get into all the uh, organizational theory that's out there because there's a lot of ways that you can organize. Um, but I do think that at least, you know, in the U.S., we, we have a, a set of organizations that do try and span that long-lived research and development, that short-lived research and development, and, you know, try our best to find ways to develop that disruptive technology. Um, I do think that, you know, what we have today is the best that the world's seen so far, but just because it's, you know, good today doesn't mean we can't improve upon it. Um, so, you know, we've got universities, we've got industry, we've got plenty of government labs um, and various government funding organizations that sort of all play their role uh, in trying to find ways to nurture science and technology. Um, but in the end, you know, we cannot do all of this in vacuum. We can't do it in stovepipes. So I think there's another force that really helps nurture science and technology, and that's just uh, we want to share what we do. Right, we want to make the world a better place uh, as best we can, and so it really comes down to so you know how do we communicate science and technology is another way that that we actually nurture it. Um, so I think the, the the simple ones, you know, archival journals and conferences, that's kind of the lay of the land, uh, at least for you know university and academic types. But I think one of the most powerful ones, uh, of course, is the uh, the arts in STEAM, right. Um, we think about cinema, books, you know, who knows what we're going to do, what we're going to do with augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, but, you know, I'm sure I could go to any conference or any room of scientists, you know, ask the question, you know, how much did Star Wars influence you? How much did Star Trek influence you? Uh, I think another aspect of this that, that sometimes is overlooked in, in disruptive technology development is the question of whether or not we should develop it, right? Um, and so the arts really give us a place, you know, science fiction, for example, it really gives us a hypothetical area where we can actually play the, what if we did develop this technology, how would that interact or change our society? Um, and so, you know, I, I credit a lot of the uh, sci-fi writers that I've read for, for giving me pause to think about, you know, whether we should do this or not. And then even more on the tactical level, um, some of you might be familiar with technology readiness levels, which I believe was first started by NASA. Uh, I can't completely remember, and it's been uh, used by many other organizations within uh, the US government and the world, uh, as well as the, the famous the Hamar Catechism. Um, so I guess sort of a, a quick leaving point here um, for at least this audience on this slide as kind of, you know, in terms of nurturing the s &T, you really need to understand like where you want to be in the ecosystem. Um, and I would argue you have to continually work to extend your radius because if you keep sort of in your stovepipe, um, you know, it makes it very hard to, to nurture your s and towards other organizations. 
Um, so kind of <clears throat> going towards uh, the tail end <clears throat> of, my, uh, of my quick talk here. Uh, so this is the big question Charles wanted me to talk about, right? How do we nurture disruption? Um, I don't know. Uh, and that's, the, that's the, the honest truth. It's very difficult to do. Uh, but you know, I have some points that, that, that I'd like to at least bring up today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, embrace question finding above answer finding. Um, you know, it's something that, that I think is, is unique and what I do like about Charles and Kate, what they're doing with the Unlab. Uh, and, you know, trying to find those questions is, is really probably, in my opinion, the utmost importance uh, to trying to nurture disruption. Um, I once uh, met a, a Buddhist monk by the name of Garchin Rinpoche, um, and uh, he didn't speak English, so I was talking to him through uh, a translator, uh, and so he simply asked me the question, knowing that as a scientist, uh, what's two plus two, and I immediately said four, and he's like, excellent, well, since you understood the question, the answer was obvious, and so this is kind of points towards the the importance of really trying to find those questions and understand those questions. Um, another thing point here I'd like to bring up, and this is just a recent reflection, is that you know DARPA uh, and its fame uh, has has been you know the progenitor or at least been behind a lot of disruptive technologies and kind of the the key thing, a key communication aspect that that we often use as the Hamar Catechism, you know, a set of simple questions that uh, Hamar, previous um, director at DARPA, uh, brought to bear. You know, what are you trying to do? How's it done to damn limitations? What's new in your approach? Why would it work? What difference will it make? And of course, the, the one that every program manager wants to know, how much will it cost and how long will it take? Um, but in some sense, the more that I think about these questions, the more that I wonder if that it's, bringing a limitation um, in the way we see science and technology development. Because um, in some sense, these questions almost lend itself to the traditional way of thinking about science first, then technology. Um, and it's almost a linear way of thinking. Now, I know I would get lots of pushback if I brought this up to uh, some of my uh, counterparts at work, but um, you know, sort of to my next bullet, um, and kind of bringing both these ideas together, both uh, the Hamar and, and what you do in your uh, everyday lives and research. Uh, if your work is not upsetting somebody, you're not pushing hard enough. Um, so, you know, uh, make sure someone's upset, make some, so someone's pissed off, you know, whatever word you want to use. But remember, a disruptive technology really usurps the way that we've done things in the past, and uh, that'll rile lots of feathers. Um, I think another way that we need to nurture disruption is really to become socially aware, uh, socially aware of your community, your country, and the world, um, because that's where you're going to see the time and place for even any potential disruption. Um, I'll get a little bit to, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, but, you know, in this sort of uh, quick philosophical escapade here, um, to, to summarize a lot of what I, I wish and what I want to see in the future going forward to, to set the stage for more disruptive development are sort of what I call giga engineering projects, right? And so, uh, Charles and Kate, which you all first, you know, kind of brought up in the last session about a, a national program here. Uh, really, I think is kind of one of the seeds for this idea of, you know, what I'm just putting in quotations, a giga engineering project. Um, so let's go back in history a little bit to think about what were some of the mega engineering projects that we had. Um, you know, examples we're all very familiar with, you know, one could argue the space race was a mega engineering example, right? Of course, that was predicated by a societal push. Um, you know, that's why NASA was uh, developed, uh, why DARPA was developed, uh, because of Sputnik. Uh, so that launched the space race and that mega engineering project, uh, look what it gave us from NASA in terms of technology, in terms of materials, you know, we can probably all thank our, our microwave that we use to heat up food some way, shape and form, uh, you know, due to, to NASA technology for that mega engineering project. Uh, another example, um, you know, the, the Manhattan Project, I don't think I need to explain much about that one. Uh, but to a more recent sort of mega engineering project, um, recently had a uh, brief from a former colleague of mine, Vincent Tang, 
who went over to be a director at the uh, National Ignition Facility, NIF. And so if you're not familiar with NIF, uh, this is a, uh, a mega engineering project in, in my parlance that's looking to create fusion greater than one. Um, and so, you know, they string up, um, for lack of a better term, a whole bunch of high energy lasers. Um, they direct these high energy lasers using fiber optics, et cetera, into a chamber uh, that looks about the size of a refrigerator. Um, and then they can create this uh, photon field where the, the pressure is uniform. And they put these pellets inside there um, so that you can compress the pellets and create fusion. So to think about a technology that comes from a mega engineering project, uh, I asked the question, well, you know, these pellets that you put in, like they have to be darn near perfect spheres, right? Because we can all imagine that if that sphere is not perfect and you have equal pressure everywhere, you're not going to get the type of uh, fusing or compactification that you need. So I asked the question and lo and behold, they're able to make these pellets uh, in perfect spheres, almost, excuse me, perfect spheres, uh, almost to three decimal points, uh, if you will. And so that just absolutely blew my mind. And sure enough, that was probably one of the most difficult things they had to do with their most recent uh, set of results that they released, as they, you know, they spent, you know, almost a couple of years trying to make a perfect sphere. Now, I don't know what else in the world's going to need a perfect sphere, but because of something like the National Ignition Facility, if I ever need a perfect sphere and sphere in some other area, I know who to go to because they can make perfect spheres, right? Um, and so I think in, in general, these sort of mega engineering projects, to even include the Large Hadron Collider, if we can move to an area of giga engineering projects, uh, it really can bring together uh, those scientists, those thinkers, those technology developers to tackle a problem that's of human concern and, you know, it brings about a environment um, where, you know, if you can, you know, secure that funding for something that we need as humans, uh, and it allows really the science and technology to play back and forth within each other, really in a, in a protected space, if you will, uh, kind of that freedom of think, uh, freedom of thought that, uh, that Charles and Kate brought up earlier. So all in all, um, you know, I don't have any golden answers about, you know, how we develop a disruptive technology. Um, but I think when we look back um, and, you know, not only from a historical perspective, but from a philosophical perspective, I think we can all say there are certain characteristics of disruptive technology. I think first and foremost, it's a composite of multiple sciences and technologies. Uh, oftentimes I get ideas uh, and or proposals that, you know, a scientist or researcher has this one really cool thing or phenomena, you know, 10x, 100x better than the way we do it today, uh, but it's really hard to do something with that uh, in a greater ecosystem. So I do see it as part of my job to try and take those uh, individual sort of, you know, breakthroughs as they would call it and say, I, I see how it's a breakthrough but I don't think it's disruptive yet. So, you know, what other things do I need to bring in this composite viewpoint to surround that science with the right technology to try and make it disruptive? Um, another characteristic of disruptive technology, it just really has to fundamentally change the way that we humans interact with each other and the way that we interact with the world. I remember science and technology development, disruptive technology development's a human endeavor. Um, so if we're going to actually develop something that, uh, uh, you know, follows the definition of disruptive technology, um, it's going to fundamentally change the way we do business. And I think the other uh, harder thing to, to actually develop, but is absolutely necessary when we think about characteristics of this type of technology, is you have to scale it up. Um, if you cannot scale it to an economy that affects, you know, multiple humans, uh, multiple human lives, uh, if not multiple human generations, uh, then, you know, it's kind of dead in the water. Uh, and with that sort of economy of scale, you know, it brings about some societal change. Uh, I don't know any disruptive technology that has not brought about a society change, uh, period. Um, and then the other hard part about developing disruptive technology is that the time and chance window for it to work or for you to find it or to implement it is finite. Um, I think that's maybe one of the most difficult things to swallow about disruptive technology. 
uh, is that you know your opportunity time window could fly by or pass you by if you're not aware of it. And I think that's why it's so important that we all take the time to become sort of philosophers and historians and also understanding where the state of the world is today, even if it's not uh, a pretty picture to look at. Um, you know, uh, climate change, global warming, giga engineering projects towards that. I think, you know, the time is, is ripe for that. It has been ripe for a long time. Uh, but I always like to look at, you know, what are some most recent examples of disruptive technology? Um, and like, I, if, if you don't think that the vaccines that we have today are a miracle, uh, then I don't think you really understand what disruptive technology is. It just, you know, makes my jaw drop. But let's take a look at it for a second, right? I mean, let's look at the composite technologies that went into that versus the science to understand mRNA. Uh, then we have a technology, cryogenic electron spectroscopy. Why that is so important is because that allowed us to identify the structure of a spike protein quicker than we thought of, quicker than we could have done without it, right? Um, so that's a technology that was actually absolutely pivotal uh, to understanding COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, the cryogenic electron spectroscopy was used for, for other spectroscopy. It just so happened, oh, we can use it for this biological matter, this, these, these viruses. Uh, another technology that was absolutely critical, uh, nanolipid encapsulation. Uh, so mRNA by itself is, is pretty unstable, right? And so if you have to turn it into a delivery system, or excuse me, you need a delivery system. So it has to be a delivery system that can maintain the structure of mRNA long enough for uh, your immune system to see it, uh, but also be able to transport it from the lab into your arm, right? So nanolipid encapsulation technologies uh, has been around for a while. Um, I remember when I was an undergraduate back in 2001, 2002, taking organic chemistry, uh, my professor at the time was working on these type of structures, right? And then there's the time and the chance, right? Global pandemic, um, all these things were ripe and the time happened, you know, unfortunately it was a global pandemic, but all these things came together uh, very quickly across government organizations because it was such a human threat um, that, you know, they developed this technology, which, you know, um, I can't wait to see what we do with it in the future, right? I mean, we're using it for COVID and flu now, uh, but every now and then you see articles pop up that, that, that rise above the, the regular news uh, noise, if you will, uh, about, you know, being applied to HIV, maybe being applied to other genetic disorders, so on and so forth. Um, and so, you know, I always sort of think about uh, another characteristic of um, disruptive technology is that, you know, to the unassuming, uh, it pretty much looks like magic. Um, you know, the, uh, these vaccines, uh, if you're not familiar with the details, are probably magic. I mean, we've been in this pandemic for what, going on into our third year, so two years now. We went from nothing, I shouldn't say nothing, we had all those composite uh, technologies, but we went almost from nothing to a vaccine in record time. Um, if that's not disruptive, I don't know what is. So I will end there um, with some thoughts on <laughs> Disruptive technology development it is, it is quite the uh, topic to talk about, and we can dive way more deeper, uh, hopefully through some conversation. Uh, but to, to finish this off, I want to say that these thoughts are, 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 are hardly my own. Um, you know, through uh, lots of study of philosophy of science, uh, starting with uh, Thomas Kuhn's book here on the left, Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, that book blew my mind when I took a uh, philosophy of science class in undergraduate. All the way to the book here on the right, uh, which I recently just read uh, over the break here, uh, which I took a number of ideas from uh, the Genesis of Techno-Scientific Revolutions uh, by Narayama, I can't pronounce it, excuse me, Narayama Murthy and uh, Sal here. Uh, I think that it was published in December of last year. I uh, highly recommend a, a read of this book. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, end my talk here. Uh, it's been a while since I gave a talk like this without the use of a whiteboard, so I hope it was enjoyable and we can have a little bit of a conversation from here on out. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, David, for such a thoughtful talk. I mean, that was just tremendous. Uh, I really appreciate the, the deep um, 
consideration you gave to this so many so many great ideas mm -hmm. for us all um i don't know if anyone would like to start the discussion hey this is sam I, so i had a concept um that i wanted to share and i wanted to address sultan's uh, comment and i think that um it's an important topic and not to stay apolitical the con the concept that was being shared was that there was scientific ideas that were being researched, then the world changed. And those scientific ideas that were being researched didn't necessarily have a demand signal to pull them along. The world changed and conditions were set such that those scientific ideas can be applied. And then they were applied. Whether they were the right or the wrong thing is not the point of the discussion. It's the mechanics of how things get transitioned, which is what we're trying to to illustrate here and that there were um, institutions that help usher things along and that's really important right so as folks that want to work in an unrestricted way uh, to have them uh, those ideas adopted in ways that can be heard by people who have significant funding um, this is what i was actually gonna like this is the challenge i was going to throw back was like do we have to wait for the world to change in um in a manner that isn't uh reversible uh, which is not okay, so climate change, right? Or how do we get people to adopt the concept of, you know, like a 75 year plan or a 200 year plan that gets that that isn't um, stimulated by a world change event that it's just the right thing to do. And I think that's what Charles and Kate are really trying to accomplish here. That's the other thing too, is like, we can't wait for an irreversible event to occur in order to promote this form of science, which is alternative propulsion, which I think is the aim point that we're trying right. to go. Right? Yes. That's not easy. And it's something that, that I struggle with as well, because it goes back to, you know, what's the general gist of driving science and technology? And that really comes down to asking the question what it means to be human, right? And so in order to care about the, the long-term plans, you really need your uh, hierarchy of needs met and that's in itself a hard thing to do for everyone, right? Just your basic food, housing, shelter, until you can get to that point where you can think about the long term. Um, so if you want to talk about disruptive technology, then something that can address those lower parts of the pyramid of needs um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 